established in 1999 to promote democratic debate about the most important economic and social issues that affect people's lives. We've done extensive work on domestic issues including Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid, labor unionization, work supports, and the housing bubble, as well as international issues including trade, the IMF and the World Bank, and economic growth in Latin America. We put this event together on very short notice, uh, realizing that there was a gap in the debate happening right now in the United States that Deeper seemed particularly qualified to fill. There's an emerging consensus that the recent crisis in the global financial markets can largely be attributed to a lack of appropriate oversight and regulation, including the accumulation of more than $8 trillion housing bubble in the United States. The bailout for Wall Street approved last week in the US Congress does not include remedies for preventing another similar crisis. The financial crisis of 2008 is likely to be for the Washington consensus with the fall of the Berlin Wall was for communism. Then we read the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, offering to coordinate the global reform process, which could begin next month when finance ministers and central bankers convene in Washington for the annual IMF World Bank meeting on October 11 to 13. This is because, according to Strauss-Kahn, the, and this is a quote, IMF is the right place to organize a global response to weaknesses in the global financial system. Today, economists Dean Baker and Mark Weisbrot will discuss the current economic crisis and consider the choice of the IMF as a future global finance regulator. Dean Baker was the first economist in the country to warn about the dangers of the $8 trillion housing bubble, and he urged the Federal Reserve Board to take steps to rein in the bubble before it grew to such dangerous proportions. While most other economists expressed surprise at the current crisis, Dean warned years ago that the collapse of the housing bubble would inevitably lead to a recession and a financial crisis. He's also been a prominent critic of the bailout package. He's the author of numerous research papers and articles on the housing bubble and the credit crisis, many of which are available on the table outside, and all of which are available on Deeper's website, depr.net. Economist Mark Weisbrot has written numerous research papers and articles on the International Monetary Fund's recommended macroeconomic policies in developing countries over the past decade. His criticisms of the fund's policy advice have been joined increasingly by world leaders, most recently at the General Assembly of the United Nations in September, where the IMF policy advice was contrasted with the massive provision of liquidity and record-breaking nationalizations taken by the U.S. government in recent months. Well, you've all been hearing a lot in the past weeks about these issues, ideas, analysis, and proposed solutions, mostly from the people who got it wrong over all of these years. So today, we're very excited to bring you two of the people who have, in recent years, gotten all of this very much right. With that, I'd like to uh, give Dean Baker the floor. Thanks. Well, getting it right in D.C. is uh, probably a handicap, so um, <laughs> well, don't hold that against me. I'll, I'll go through four, uh, four parts. Uh, I won't talk that long, but four parts. But first, I want to say a little bit about the economic crisis. You know, where are we? What got us here? Um, secondly, uh, talk a bit about the Paulson plan. Then the third thing, I want to say a little bit about the marketing pitch. We really had an extraordinary marketing pitch for that plan, uh, something like which I've never seen, at least not in my lifetime. And lastly, uh, just a sort of mini forecast where I think we're going, you know, what the immediate issues are going forward with the economy. So starting with point one, um, it's remarkable to me, you know, even as we've had this housing crash, um, you know, I was out there flapping my arms about the bubble, people not taking me seriously. Um, I'm used to that. Um, you, know, you know, I've been talking about this for a long time, and people are saying, oh, no, there's no big deal. Um, I debated, by the way, the chief economist from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac several times, and whenever I said that they're going to be real, real serious problems, they're just going, you're being ridiculous. I, I'm trying to see if I can find those guys to be a little unemployed. Um, but, but, you know, it's the real story here is the housing bubble front and center, and I think it, it's still striking to me that even after the crash, even after we've seen house prices fall by some measures 20% in nominal terms, close to 30% adjusting for inflation, you still don't, you still have a lot of people are talking about this and they don't recognize it was a housing bubble. They talk about the mortgages. We had crazy mortgages. We had all these people with, you know, subprime mortgages that there was no way on earth they'd be able to pay off. They were adjustable rates. They could pay the teaser rate. They couldn't pay the, the adjusted rate. They, they had uh, bought homes with no money down. They had cases that most of you have probably heard now about a ninja loan, no income, no job, no assets. You know, um, I mean, 
exploding arms. That was the other great term. You know, this was widely known, and that was part of the story. But what underlined that was, of course, the bubble. I mean, no one, you know, in ordinary times, banks don't deliberately make loans to people who can't pay them off. Go to your bank and tell them I want to borrow money I can't pay it off. Um, they aren't likely to make you a loan. The reason why they were willing to do it in 2004, 2005, 2006 was it didn't matter. As long as the house prices are going up 10, 15, 20% a year, it doesn't matter if you're lying about every single thing out there. They couldn't care less. Maybe you never worked a day in your life. You don't have a penny to your name. What, why on earth would they care? They're lending you money on a home that's selling for 200000 today, and in two years it's going to sell for two fifty, and four years it's going to sell for three. If you don't make the payments, they take the home back. They're going to sell it. You know, they don't care. So what was really front and center there was the bubble. You know, the second part of the story, the crazy leverage that you had, you know, Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers and, and Bear Stearns leveraging themselves to the hill. Again, that amplified the problem. That made it a much bigger problem. Uh, Fannie and Freddie, I should say, you know, they were probably the worst in terms of leverage. But, you know, what really got them the problem, again, was the housing bubble. You know, particularly Fannie and Freddie, you could be very, very heavily leveraged in prime mortgages, because prime mortgages don't generally go bad. And when they do, you know, these are mortgages you put, you know, 20% down or got mortgage insurance on, you know, what, the way things used to work 10 years ago. Um, you're not going to take a big loss on it. You know, most of that's going to be covered. So what really mattered here was that house prices went through the roof here. They, by, one, by uh, this measure, they, just, they rose by more than 80% in inflation-adjusted terms, and they've now fallen about halfway back. So really what's front and center was the housing bubble. And it's important to recognize that because, well, I'll come back to this in a second, but that really was at the core of our problem. We had a bubble-driven economy, and that was what should have been addressed front and center. Now, I'll just quickly say, we can talk more about it later, but you know, what could have been done? Well, what I always say, what the most obvious thing that, and Alan Greenspan's bill number one in my story, and I'm glad other people are now seeing him that way as well, um, what could have been done, first and foremost, was Ellen Greenspan could have talked about it. Um, if you kind of like the poo-poo talk, but I always say, you know, there, there's a, you know, you all know the line, talk is cheap, so, you know, what would have been the harm? And I don't mean muttering, you know, under his breath, the rational exuberance, as Greenspan did back in 96 about the stock bubble. I mean, coming out with charts, with papers, showing the data. I had this, I would gladly share it with Greenspan if he could get Spetty Congress to do it, which, of course, he could. Um, and pointing out that there is no bubble. The reason why I was so confident saying that there was a bubble was because I went around, you know, harassing people and going, tell me why I'm wrong. You know, and there was no one, and this was back in 02 when I first started raising the issue, and it just got worse and worse, so 03, 04, 05, and 06. There was no causal explanation for this 80% run up in house prices. And I have government data that goes back to 1950. Robert Schiller from Yale University constructed the data going back to 1895 where it shows from 1895 to 1995, we have a 100 year long trend where house prices just kept pace with inflation. You got a 100 year long trend, house prices are just even with inflation, suddenly your house prices rise by 80%. No one has a plausible explanation for it. I don't think it takes a lot of creativity to say you have a bubble. Okay, now the last point, if anyone doubted, uh, the other line you have here is rents. Rents aren't going anywhere. Now, we have a single housing market. Rents and, and house sale prices don't move together, but they move more or less in the same direction for the obvious reason that people have a choice between renting and owning. People aren't going to sell their house and you know move across the street to a rental just because you know they think the price is too high. But over time, people do move. You know, kids form their own households. They move into an area. Uh, people from other areas move into an area. And if house sale prices are usually out of line with rents, they're going to opt to rent rather than own. So if there was something fundamental in the housing market that was driving up prices like that, it should have shown up in both rental prices and ownership prices. And obviously it didn't. This is real, real simple stuff. You know, you can try to make it very complicated, but the basic story was incredibly simple. And it was absolutely, you know, uh, incredible negligence on Greenspan's part, the Fed's part, not to have recognized it, not to try and do something about it. Now again, as I say, I think talk would have done it. I think had Greenspan used his congressional testimonies and said, you know, instead of telling people to go out and buy a home, as he did, or get adjustable rate mortgages, as he did, don't worry, there's no bubble, as he did. If he instead said, I am very concerned that there is a serious housing bubble here, people are going to lose a lot of money in their homes. The people lending money are going to lose a lot of homes. The people buying securitized mortgages are going to lose a lot of homes. Had Alan Greenspan said that, that would have put the fear of God into a lot of people. It's very hard for me to believe that wouldn't have had an impact. 
And again, as I've always said, talk is cheap. Go ahead and do it. If it doesn't have an impact, fine. Just take second steps. Other steps you could have taken, the bad mortgages that were going on, this was no secret. A lot of us were talking about this, you know, 2004, 2005, 2006. The ninja loans were widely known. There's no way on earth that Alan Greenspan didn't know that there were junk loans being made all over the country. He chose to ignore it. They had the regulatory authority to crack down on that. And they since actually used it. They set up guidelines this year, 2008, to talk about, you know, closing the door after the horses have left, you know. But, um, you know, they opted not to do that. And, you know, to my mind, as I said, it was absolutely criminal. The last point on that is obviously they could have raised interest rates. I don't like to raise interest rates. I think, you know, it slows down the economy, deliberately throws people out of work. As a general rule, I would not advocate that. But given the choice that the Fed had used its other tools, the Greenspan had done everything he could by trying to scare people to death about the bubble. If he had used his regulatory powers to the full, his full ability, and you still had this bubble going, I would raise interest rates, because the damage from this bubble was so extreme, particularly a housing bubble, that you would have been better off slowing the economy, trying to have a controlled recession than the sort of uncontrolled crash that we're seeing now. So that's sort of a quick story on you know, the housing bubble. Let me go through some of the ramifications here. Um, the basic story of the housing bubble, on the one hand, obviously, you had the housing market go through its roof. We had year record rates of housing construction over the years 2002 to 2006. It expanded from its normal share of GDP over the post-war period, about 4%, to being about 6% of the economy, so about 50% larger than its normal share. That was a very big stimulus. But the other part of the story was that we had a huge amount of consumption based on the housing bubble. This is actually the bigger part of the story because people were spending based on their consumption that their housing wealth, which is a perfectly rational thing to do. You have a whole group of people around D.C. who go around ranting about how people aren't thinking about tomorrow, how they're spending rather than saving. That's actually not a stupid thing. If you see your house price go from 300000 to 400 to 450 and everyone's telling you it's going to go to six, and I mean the experts are telling you it's going to go to six, why bother to save? Your house is rising, you know, your, the house is doing it for you. It's a perfectly reasonable thing. Take a vacation, get a new car, whatever it is, you know. Why would you scrimp if your house price is going up in value by, you know, by 20000 30000 every year? And that, that was the story that people saw. That's why it was so important that Alan Greenspan attacked the bubble. People were spending money that really wasn't there. It looked like it was there, but it wasn't there. So we see that the savings rate fell under 1% in 2004, and it's been very, very close to 1%. In, in the period since. So basically, you had a story where because of housing wealth, people were spending like crazy, and that drove the economy. Okay, so that helped boost the economy over this period. But again, it, it was not going to last because the bubble wealth was not going to last. OK, the next point, um, you know, what happens when you have house prices are too high? Um, I probably should have just focused on one of these. But I have vacancy rates. This is, this is called supply and demand. Economists used to believe in it. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of things that they taught to me when we were in grad school they don't seem to adhere to anymore. But um, anyhow, the basic story here is you, you, you had vacancy rates of rental units and then ownership units rise to a record high. Um, vacancy rates for rental units just went over 10%. Rental units could be converted to over ownership units. You all have heard of condos. You know, it happens. So if you're sitting around there with a place that you're trying to rent and no one's buying it, you know, at some point you're going to look to, to, to convert it to a rental to an ownership unit. The other, the other chart is the ownership unit chart itself. Um, there's twice as many ownership units as rental units. And very few people can afford to carry two mortgages. The reason why I regret putting this on the same chart is that it's a little hard to see. But basically, the vacancy rate on ownership units is 50% higher than any previous peak. So it hit 2.8%. I think it was at 2.9% at its peak. It had never previously been above 1.8%. Okay? And we have had housing slumps before. So we're talking about an incredible vacancy rate on ownership and, and rental units both. My reason for mentioning this is, one, it was one more piece of confirmation, those who were wondering where, whether anything unusual was going on in the, the housing market. If you looked at those vacancy rates, that could have told you something. But the other thing is there's a lot of people running around in Capitol Hill who say, oh, what we have to do is support house prices. And frankly, it's about the most harebrained idea I've ever heard of. Um, you know, I love to pick up the New York Times and go on these diatribes against uh, farm price supports, some of which are, you know, they're right on. But, you know, everything they say about farm price supports being stupid policy, inefficient, blah, 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 multiply it by about 100. You know, if you want to have a house price support program, that's about the silliest thing I ever heard of. 
house prices are going to fall. If I could stamp my finger and have house prices adjust tomorrow, I would do that. I can't, but you know, I, I, there's absolutely no public interest in trying to keep overvalued house prices. I sometimes joke about it that that would be our, our government's unaffordable housing program. Um, why would we want house prices to be too high? I just can't understand that. Okay, the last point, uh, I'll try to walk you through this because I realize the way I did this, it isn't very clear. Um, the real villain in this story, um, the underlying villain, is our trade deficit. We have a trade deficit, this is going back to, to 06, it was 5.7% of GDP, it's a little less than that now. We have a trade deficit of 5.7% of GDP here we did, and the reason for that was the dollar. We had a high dollar. And again, this is, a, this is something we used to talk about in grad school, they don't talk about it anymore, but the value of the dollar is going to determine your trade deficit. You know, sorry folks, that is what determines it. If you want a lower trade deficit, you want a lower dollar. If you want a high dollar, you want a high trade deficit. This is about as simple as it gets. The dollar determines the value, what we pay for our imports. You know, we have a lot of people run around and say, well, we have a high trade deficit because we have a budget deficit. I have never yet met a person who buys the imported good rather than the domestically produced good because we have a budget deficit. It's crazy. You buy the imported good because it's cheaper. And why is it cheaper? It's cheaper because the dollar is high. Okay, if we want people to buy the domestically produced good rather than the imported good, get the dollar down. The imported good becomes more expensive, you then buy the domestically produced good. Same thing happens overseas. We get the dollar down, all the junk we're producing, it's suddenly 10, 20, 30% cheaper in Europe and Latin America and China. It suddenly becomes more affordable. People will buy more of our exports. The basic story here is you have to get the dollar down. The people who want a high dollar want a high trade deficit. They may not know that, but they do. Okay, so that, that's the basic story. So we go, okay, so we have this high trade deficit. Let's say we want to get something close to full employment. Well, basically, if you have a high trade deficit, it, a lot of an accounting identity, what that means is we're borrowing from abroad, that means we have to be saving very little here. So we have three choices. On the one hand, we can have, have a very large government deficit. The government deficit equals 8% of GDP. That would get us, you know, an offsetting, I won't go through all these assumptions that get us here. That would, that would offset a trade deficit of 5.7% of GDP with normal household savings rates. That's about 8% savings rate. That was our historic average before we got to this period. Um, so what would a government deficit of 8% GDP be? That would be 1.2 trillion. Okay, so that would be one way to offset the trade deficit if we had normal household savings. Case two, suppose we, we maintain a modest uh, budget surplus and instead we, we do it on the, I'm sorry, we, we do it on, check my graph here. Number, number two is the next order. Let me jump to number three. Number three is suppose we do it by savings, that we run a balanced budget as many people want to do, we continue with the trade deficit we have, we'd have to have, have a savings rate, household savings rate that was equal to almost minus 4% of GDP, or as a share of household income, it would have to be a negative savings rate of about 7%. I don't think any of us want to see that. We have even more dissaving than we had over the last few years. And the middle one is a mix of the two, which is more or less where we've been lately, to have both very weak household savings and a very large budget deficit. But the point here that I want to draw on is simply that if you have a large trade deficit, as we've had, you have to have either a large budget deficit or very, very low savings or a mixture of the two. There is no way around it. Okay, I'll come back to that in a minute. Now let me just quickly trash the Paulson plan and then come back to my forecast. Okay, the Paulson plan, just three basic points on it. One, he was very inefficient in his design. Two, it ended up rewarding incompetence. It rewarded the people who got us here. And three, it did nothing for the homeowners. It very little for the homeowners who are affected. Um, first off, in, in the design, it's inefficiency. It, it was absolutely remarkable to me that there was this incredible consensus from left to right among economists that this is the wrong way. If you're going to do a bailout of the banks, there's some economists who don't want to bail out the banks. But those who those, of course, are trying to keep the banking system operating. The way you do it is directly through an equity infusion. You buy equity directly in the banks. You can find people at AEI, at Heritage, at Cato, you know, along with everyone to the left of that. We're all saying the same things. What does Henry Paulson propose doing? He wants to pay too much for bad assets. You know, that gives them capital. I mean, we, we buy 700 billion of assets. We pay 700 billion for assets that are worth 350 billion. That's like giving them 350 billion capital. But the alternative was we could just give them 700 billion of capital. Or if we just want to give them 350 billion capital, we could just do that through direct equity injections. Okay, it's a very, very inefficient way of doing it. Secondly, it rewards incompetence. Well, 
we're leaving the folks who got us there in place. You know, we're buying their bad, we're buying their junk. You know, so you have all these, you know, these executives that basically wreck their banks and have also wrecked our economy as a side effect. And you know, we're going to leave them there and just pay too much for their junk. Why do we want to do that? You have people on stock; they're going to be very happy. You know, I was going to show up, uh, not immediately with them, but just opposite Warren Buffett. And someone said, "Well, Warren Buffett failed. You know, favors the bailout." I go, "He just invested five billion in Goldman Sachs. Of course, he favors the bailout." You know, uh, you know, you're, you're going to help the stockholders. You know, if we have lots of money to go around, sure, help the stockholders. But you know, that that really should not be the priority. You don't want to reward the people who brought us here. Um, and the last point, I mean, it's just incredible. We got very little, almost nothing for homeowners. I mean, we got, you know, commitments. We'll see what they're worth from Henry Paulson. He's supposed to try to do workouts. We'll see what's done. But, you know, when it came, for example, something that you knew would have an effect, you changed the bankruptcy law so that a bankruptcy judge can treat a home mortgage just like any other debt that comes before them, the credit card debt, the car loan, any other debt that could reset the terms. They refused to budge on that. That was dropped from the table at the word go, which, again, it's kind of strange, given that supposedly we had the Great Depression looming there if we didn't pass the bill, that you weren't willing to rewrite the bankruptcy law. Very strange. Okay, so that's a quick take on, on, on the, the bailout. Let me just jump to the sales pitch, because I think it, it really was striking. I, you know, we saw this incredible uniformity among the lead opinion that you know we needed this. And it was just it, it was just kind of remarkable because you had you know everyone was absolutely convinced we needed it or we got the Great Depression. Whereas I'm sure 99% of all those people who knew we needed it or we'd have the Great Depression couldn't begin to tell you why or how. I mean, it's just this amazing, really, arrogance and elitism, you know, all the things that uh, my good friend Sarah Palin always talks about. I mean, it, it was really a witness there because you had people who, you know, all consider themselves very well educated, very well informed, but you didn't know what they're talking about. You know, and they were absolutely convinced that you had the unmushed masses out there who were going to allow their anger and resentment to prevent the economy from being saved. Well, no, actually, the unwashed masses, although I'm sure they didn't understand the details of the bailout, were exactly right. This was a very poorly designed bailout which would reward the people who got us here. Why should people not be upset about that? You know, it's very hard to tell someone why, you know, a normal person who gets their, their living working as a truck driver or cleaning toilets should pay higher taxes so that, you know, Henry Boston's friends at Goldman Sachs could get even more money in their paycheck. I don't know a good argument for that. Maybe someone else does, but I don't. Um, but you know, anyhow, that's where we were, and it was really remarkable that you had this uniformity. You had people saying things which were absolute nonsense. President Bush got on TV, said we may have a Great Depression. That's the first time I ever heard a politician say that his own policies could bring out the Great. You know, usually saying to the other guy, your policies are. No, he said, you know, I might give you the Great Depression. <laughs> incredible, incredible. I've never seen anything like that. And, you know, we also had, you know, I, I bring my Washington Post with me. You know, this was, this was the day after, but it, you know, repeats the line throughout. There was no plan B. You know, there was no alternative. You know, if we didn't do this, there was no alternative. Well, could have had direct injections of capital. The United Kingdom just did that. Didn't Henry Paulson know that? Did that, he didn't know about the idea. You know, it was done by Sweden back in '92. This was not a mystery. Every economist in the country is talking about it. So there's no plan B. We've never heard that. You know, and the other part of the story that you know I was really struck by, and I'll confess I didn't know this, the Fed had the authority to directly buy commercial paper from non-financial corporations. This is a really big story. It's a little techie stuff, but you know, most major companies they finance themselves on an ongoing basis by issuing you know commercial paper, typically 90-day notes that banks buy and then resell or they can hold it. And that's how they get the money to meet their bills, to buy their material, make their paychecks, you know, meet their other bills. Well, that market was freezing up. It was, it was much more expensive, or in some cases, altogether impossible for even very sound companies to raise money in the commercial paper market. It's a very, very bad story. You know, so you get a Verizon or some big company that you know, is fundamentally sound, it's not about to go out of business, they're going to have to lay off workers. What can they do? Very scary story. Well, it turns out the Fed had the option they could just buy the commercial paper themselves. I actually didn't know they had the legal authority to do that. They do have the legal authority to do that. No one mentioned that before the bailout passed. It was after it passed, suddenly the Fed goes out there and, what do you know? They're buying up commercial paper from that. It's not very honest. Not very honest. Let me just mention one other thing in the, the dishonesty department. Again, carrying my Washington Post with me. Um, front page of the business section uh, the day after the bill passes. New law seeks to limit executive compensation. And they talked to Greg Crystal, a good guy, the leading expert on executive compensation. He said, this won't limit anyone's pay. Okay, why did they talk to Greg Crystal the day before the vote? Okay, because we had a lot of people running around there saying, 
We're going to crack down on executive pay. There aren't going to be any more of these big paychecks. Well, that wasn't true. And they could have talked to Greg Crystal and they could have told everyone that. The people were saying that either didn't know what they were talking about or weren't being honest. Take your pay. But they didn't bother to tell us that. They didn't want the unwashed masses to know that. Okay. And, you know, so that wasn't very funny. I'll just leave that one in that and come back to my quick forecast because I'm probably over my time here. Okay, where do I see things going? Um, first and foremost, obviously, the immediate crisis is this financial crisis. Can we keep the system going? Um, I'm actually fairly confident of that. Uh, two reasons. One is, you know, we've discovered more duct tape than I realized. The Fed can buy non, you know, paper, commercial paper of non-financial corporations. They have a lot of duct tape. You know, that that will get them very far. They lowered the uh, they lowered the, the discount, I'm sorry, the federal funds rate that was coordinated with the other major banks in the world. That was a very good thing. They lowered it at half a point. Um, they got ECB to do it, the European Central Bank. I don't know what goes on there. Those people are half crazy, but they still have a four and a quarter point interest. You know, the Fed was at two and a quarter, they had four and a quarter. Our inflation rate's higher than theirs. I don't know what they think over there. But in any case, they somehow managed to get them to lower their, their, their rate, their overnight money rate by a half a point. Presumably, they'll, they'll go further. That's a very, very good sign. Uh, also, from the papers this morning, it now sounds like Henry Paulson is actually thinking of doing, you know, Plan B, direct injection of capital route. Um, I, I'm very pleased to hear that. I hope that there's a lot of pressure on him to do that, because basically that is the way you should do it. And, you know, maybe he's letting his concern for the economy overcome his allegiance to his former colleagues at Goldman Sachs and other people on Wall Street. That is very, very good news. If he goes that route, that will be very, very good news. So my expectation is we will get through the immediate financial crisis. There will be more bank failures. There will definitely be a lot of very bad news coming from the financial sector, but we will get through that. Now, we are still going to have a very serious recession. Going back to the slide up here, we have to switch from a situation where we were had a near zero savings rate to a situation where we have a normal savings rate, somewhere around 8% household income. That's going to be very bad news. And in President Bush's effort to scare people to death, I think he probably did scare people to death, we're probably going to have that change take place very quickly. A lot of the data that we're getting, we don't have that much yet for the last you know, last week or two in, in, in September since he made his speech, but a lot of the data or anecdotes certainly suggest that people are hugely curtailing their consumption. On the one hand, that's a good thing. People have to do that. You have people in their 50s that don't have dime to their name at this point. You know, they're going to be totally dependent on their Social Security and their retirement. They have to start saving. They should start saving. It's a good thing to do that. It's not a good thing that they do it all at once. So we're likely to see a recession. We're likely to see a very bad recession. And the question is, how can we have an effective policy response? Um, the immediate issue has to be stimulus. I was glad to see uh, Nancy Pelosi suggesting $150 billion. I've been saying 300 to 400 and that might sound out of line. The last year I was saying 150 when they were saying 75, and two weeks later they were saying 150. So we'll see where that goes. Um, that's the immediate story. Over a longer term, we have to correct the trade balance, and that means getting the dollar down. And unfortunately, our politicians are scared to say that. Uh, but we have to get the dollar down. It's been going the wrong, wrong way lately, but we really do need to get the dollar down. Um, we could do that unilaterally. We don't have to beg anyone. We could get the dollar down as a matter of policy. Um, ideally, it would be coordinated. but that front and center has to be the top item over the longer term objective to get the dollar down to a level that allows for something close to balanced trade. I mean, I'm not, you don't need a you know, perfectly balanced trade just like you don't need a perfectly balanced budget, but we should be somewhere close to balanced trade, and we're obviously very far from that today. So I'll stop with that. And